In 1959, Alvin Ailey walked into a YWCA on 8th Avenue and 50th Street looking for rehearsal space and helped create Clark Center for the Performing Arts. Not only did Clark Center become Ailey's home, but also an incredible arts center, offering instruction and performance and a home for dance, theater, opera, and playwrights horizons. Dancers at Clark Center were guided and nurtured by incredible directors. As Jennifer Dunning wrote, Clark Center gave dancers the chance to move, create, whether or not they had the right kind of build, skin color, or bank account. A feast of just about every kind of dance in the most welcoming of atmospheres. Clark Center offered classes with the best dance faculty in New York City. Beginning in 1960, Clark Center introduced over 120 choreographers who formed companies produced by Clark Center's Dance Horizons. These emerging companies were given professional support, a showcase, and funds to pay dancers, exposing their work to a wide audience. Those who traced their beginnings to Clark Center represented the full spectrum of the dance world. The new choreographer series, begun in 1962, suggested by Ailey himself, provided the opportunity for young unknowns to cut their teeth and become experienced artists. You will recognize these new choreographers who proudly exerted their influence and are still making creative contributions. Clark Center NYC is committed to remembering our past, dancing into our future. Hey everyone. <laughs> it's really great to see all of you here. Thank you for coming out to the Library for the Performing Arts tonight. My name is Evan Leslie. Um, I produce our public program series here. Uh, it was great standing out in the lobby, uh, seeing so many familiar faces coming back into the library. Um, I see a few people just now that I didn't notice before. It's great having you here. Did you guys have a good summer? We had a good summer here, too. It was a little bit slow, but starting tonight, we're kicking things back off again um, with a celebration. And it's a one that I know is meaningful to all of you. It's meaningful to me, too. Um, we were talking backstage. I was curious, how many people feel like they've got maybe five degrees of separation between themselves and a class at the Clark Center? Okay. How many people feel like they've got maybe four degrees of, between themselves and, some, and, and the Clark Center? Three degrees, two degrees, one degree. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the Clark Center was established in 1959. So that was 60 years ago this year. And from what I understand, learning a little bit about the history myself, it went on as an exhilarating intersection point where Lots of people's different histories overlapped and crossed. Lots of different amazing artists, dancers, teachers, students came together, found themselves working together, maybe by happenstance. It was an incubator space. It was a spot where all of these histories could overlap um, and amazing new things could happen there. Um, that ability, that, that intersection point uh, where different histories coincide and where inspiration can be found is something that I kind of hope this library can be like, too, in a different way. Um, and you add with that uh, maybe a dialogue with history as well. So tonight, we're using our archives. You saw some of those pictures on the screen. Those can be discovered here by researchers and dancers and maybe some of you that might find your, may, maybe were featured in some of those programs. Um, we're using our archive to celebrate that history. Now, um, the truth is there, as I kind of alluded to, there are so many stories, there are way too many stories for us to share. There are so many videos of performances that have a essential link to the Clark Center, too many for us to show. Um, 
So I was talking to the folks backstage, and I want to—I want you all to agree to this too. We're just going to have to meet back here, same time, same place, a few more times, and we can continue to tell this history. Um, we've got some incredible special guests that have been very involved in helping us not forget how important the Clark Center was. They're going to be featured on this stage. But I kind of want us to feel like maybe tonight the Bruno Walter Auditorium has the same atmosphere as hanging out after class, where everybody's sharing a story, sharing a memory. So there's going to be some times where I'm sure you know certainly more than me about what was just seen on the stage, might have your own opinion about some of the comments that are made or a memory that relates. We're gonna find some time to make sure that everybody gets a chance to share uh, in the conversation. Um, but now, I really want you to help me welcome to our library stage some people that have been leaders in helping Clark Center stay remembered and relevant. Um, one of those people is uh, a founding member of the Charles Moore Dance Theater. Um, she studied at the Clark Center, and she has a really interesting multifaceted, she's kind of a real library artist. She has a multifaceted career because she is not only a great dancer, but she's also, she describes herself as an accidental historian. She's a writer. She's a visual artist. Um, please welcome to our library stage, Ramona Candy. <laughs> Um, we're also very lucky to have a founding member of Ballet Hispanico here. She was a principal dancer there. She studied with Tina Ramirez. She's on the faculty of the Ballet Hispanico Dance School now and teaches in all sorts of other places around town. We're very lucky to have Sandra Rivera here. Um, our next guest is a choreographer, dancer, and a teacher. He started dancing with the Chuck Davis Company when he was 15 years old, and then went on to work with Elio Palmieri, with Fred Benjamin, with Alvin Ailey, with Jose Limon. Um, he did a lot of his own projects as well, and worked at the Clark Center. Very proud to have Marshall Romain. <laughs> And also with us is one of the founding ballerinas of the Dance Theater of Harlem. She also performed uh, in Porgy and Bess in 1991 with the Metropolitan Opera, uh, with a choreography from another Clark Center-related person, Carmen de Lavalot. Um, she performed the role of Rosa Parks in Gordon Parks' film, Made for Television. And she's an essential part of the new Clark Center remembering movement, and that's Sheila Rohan. And our next guest, um, a lot of people think she works for the New York Public Library <laughs> because she's here so much and she knows so much about this history and it's just been such a pleasure for all of us here at the library to feel like she's really part of our team. Um, it's been great for me to get to know her. Uh, but she's also a, a Clark Center alum. She was a teacher there, a dancer. Um, but these days, she's working so hard producing incredible events to celebrate the Clark Center and to lift up new generations of emerging choreographers and dancers, just like the legacy of Clark Center um, motivates her to do. And that's Jill Williams. All right. This is a good group. Uh, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, so, Jill, I moved here from Texas in 2013. I was only here a couple of weeks when um, Jan Schmidt, who is a former curator of the Dance Division, said, uh, said to you, I think, oh, you need to talk to Evan about that. And, <laughs> and I didn't know what I was getting into, but you introduced me to Dudley Williams. Right, right. Um, and that's, that's how we started working together, celebrating the Clark Center. Um, so it's really great to have you on the stage thank yourself. You. Um, I'm curious because we're, we're celebrating the Clark Center 
we talked about, I talked about in my introduction, it really is a, a whole community story. It's not just the story of one great person or one place. It's the story of a, a, a spot which was an intersection of so many different artists' stories. Um, and that happened 60 years ago. But then there was a moment where that, uh, where the, the history went dormant and it seemed like everybody forgot. But a few years, that year when we met, I think, you started um, with other folks creating a movement to remember the Clark Center. So I just want you to tell me the story because you've told it to me before. I'm really curious, how does Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, Romari Bearden, and this humble little library on the Upper West Side all relate to each other? In, I believe it was April of 2011, Sheila Rohan, who was working for the Bearden Foundation, Ramona Candy, who loves his work and is a collagist as well, and myself were at an exhibition at the Cummings Foundation. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the exhibit. Activist, artist as activist. And the three of us kind of came together in the center of this space, and Sheila said, oh my goodness, we're all here, we were all at Clark Center, and it, it's gone. And we said, let's do something about it. And that was basically how we began. I, um, the first thing I did was I called my good friend Jackie Malone, who does a lot of dance research. I said, where do I start? She said, gather people. I said, gather people. Then I called, <laughs> I called Bruce Hawkins, who knew everybody on Facebook. I said, <laughs> I said, Bruce, can we do this? He said, yeah, yeah. So we started with four members. One, two, three, and Bruce. And we now have over 1,200 members. And, and since the beginning, our first event was in 2013, where we produced an event at the Schomburg featuring the career of Loretta Abbott. And uh, since that point, we've done at least 25 other events. Oh. And you're doing quite a lot this year, too, which we'll talk about. Okay. Um, but <laughs> uh, going back in time, though, we, we've been, the, the six of us were um, trying to decide how to tell the story. And one way we thought we could get into it is by talking about some of the folks that directed the center. And we thought we'd start our conversation about Clark Center's directors by um, talking about a woman who worked with several of you when you first got started at the Clark Center. Um, Jill, I know you got started there when Kathy Grant was in charge. Can you tell us a little bit about Kathy Grant? I, I know a lot of you know Kathy, or knew Kathy. She had red hair and freckles, and she was fierce. And... At that point, I know Marshall remembers, it was like a cage where the office was. Mm -hmm, that's Kathy and Louise. And I mean, it, it was almost like a blessing that she was behind this. <laughs> she was scary. <laughs> but um, Ka Kathy was the arts administrator. Um, she became a... Uh, the guru of Pilates, which is where I worked with her. <clears throat> but she also had a brilliant dancing career that most of us were either unaware of or had never seen. Can we? Yeah, yeah. So we, Jill found in our collection a wonderful performance that Kathy Grant is involved in. It's a work by Donald McKay. They called her Moses. And it was broadcast on television on camera three in 1960. So uh, I'm going to ask Mike to bring down the lights and we can watch a little bit of this. While the lights are going down, I want you to, uh, Kathy has like a little hat and a dark top. But the other dancers are Arthur Mitchell, Donald McHale, Carmen de Lavalad, uh, Jackie Walcott, and Sylvia Waters. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So Marshall, you started uh, taking classes at the Clark Center during Kathy Grant's uh, tenure as director, right? Yes. Can I you? started uh, against 1968. Uh, uh, so she was very strict. Yeah. Um, we had to re um, get our report cards. We had to make sure she checked her report cards before we took class. Uh, but she and, and uh, inspired us to go and look at other dance uh, classes, their elders, which was very important uh, because it was open where we could see Graham, we could see Horton, we could see Limon, you could see African dance class. And we were inspired. Uh, by it, and we wanted to learn. So that's the way she enticed us. You want to take that class? Let me see your report card. <laughs> what, what all did you study when you were there? Excuse me? What all did you study when you were there? Uh, I took all the decks, uh, all the techniques, in, including African, including uh, uh, flamenco, East Indian, everything that helped me in my career. Because thank God, thank the Clark Center, I worked constantly throughout my, my career. To, I did from dance companies to Broadway. And because of Clark Center, I had that uh, inspiration to do so. We, we actually have a, a short clip of Kathy Grant talking about the Clark Center, too. Let's just play that really quick. I don't think we need to bring down the lights too much. It's pretty short. And this is from the library's collection. Now, but back to the Clark Center. Oh, the Clark Center. <laughs> that was, uh, that program introduced a lot of young black choreographers to the city, didn't it? Yeah, I had a new choreographer. Workshop. I remember that. And Anna Sokol over her stair and mm -hmm. Jimmy Truitt. It was quite a, mm -hmm. quite a center. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's a person, his name is Charlie Rockwell, and he lived in the same house I lived in, the same apartment I lived in. And he was the first black stage manager of the Broadway show, so that made him famous. And somebody asked him, they wanted to do something in Clark Center, and name it Clark Center because of the woman who was giving the money. And they wanted somebody to run it. And I think someone else did it before me. I do not remember her name because I wasn't in that group at the time. And then she went on a sabbatical, kind of, and never came back. <laughs> well, you were very much associated with that. Yeah, yeah, well, she never came back. So Charlie Blackwell said, go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah, and so I had it. That was a very important place. Yeah, I had all the black. Like Elio Pumare and uh, Rob Rogers and uh, Alvin Ailey. Right. And I gave him uh, working space, and there rehearsal were, space. There were very few organizations like that at the time where young choreographers could show work. I don't know of any really. <laughs> yeah. Just because um, some of us. I'm curious about the actual place, Marshall, Jill. When you when you showed up at Clark Center, walked through the doors, what was the vibe like? What was the space like? What was that experience? What are your memories of? Everybody was there. I mean, there were people who just, I don't think they ever took class, but they were there. <laughs> um, there were musicians there. That, you know, um, last uh, June, Ramona curated a uh, art ex exhibition for us. And we used the work of a lot of artists who came to Clark Center and used the dancers as their muse. So that was happening. Uh, there were writers, there were poets, and there were, there were dancers of every level. And where was it located at this space? Originally, it was um, on 51st Street and 8th Avenue. And I have the Y. I do Y on the second floor. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a re it was residence upstairs, right? Yes, the residence was upstairs. Right. And also we had the theater. 
that's one thing about uh, Kathy. Uh, we had not only to take a dance, we had to take drama, and we had, uh, I performed in an opera. <laughs> Never sang, but I played Toby. <laughs> uh, though, but those are the training that you got uh, in the place, and it was so good, because it was the, the mecca, a mecca of the world. Every band, every style, every color, every uh, culture was shared in that space. So we're, we're going to move on to the next phase of Clark Center's history by talking about the next director of uh, Clark Center. And to help us uh, learn a little bit more about the woman that's there with Kathy Grant, Louise Roberts, I want to... Yeah. We have a, another special guest here. This is, this is Shelly Frankel. And uh, Shelly is an incredible performer herself. She's been on mi in many Broadway productions. Um, she also uh, uh, danced in Donald McHale's work, like we saw earlier. Um, and she uh, has been kind enough to agree to talk a little bit about Louise Roberts. Well, not kind. But uh -huh. Jill Brow beat me into doing this. So. <laughs> I said no a hundred times, but a hundred and one time I had to say yes. So uh, Louise Roberts, you could Google her and learn all about the facts of her life, but I wanted to speak about her in a very personal way, and though I'll talk a little bit about myself and her, the fact is that there were generations, maybe thousands of young people who were lucky enough to have her cross their path at the beginning of their career, and she changed their worlds, and she changed mine. So when I was 17, I had an epiphany. I was going to be a dancer. Of course, I never took a class. I knew nothing about it. But I saw the Bob Hamilton trio on the old Your Show of Shows. And that was it. I mean, that's what I was going to do. So I looked in the yellow pages, and I found the June Taylor School. And I went up there. And uh, I walked to the reception desk. And there was this woman behind the reception desk. And I said to her, I want to be a dancer. Can you help me? And that woman was Louise Roberts. If anybody else had been there, I'm sure that they would have said, Honey, <laughs> you never had a class. It's too late. But not Louise. She, was, she said, I'll help you. She became, I'm not even using my notes here. Look at this. Um, she became my mentor, my manager, um, my mother figure. And most importantly, she became a lifelong friend. Uh, her own passion for dance began when she went, went to college and she took a course in modern dance, and that was it for her. She was in love. Her position at, as the manager at June Taylor's was full-time. It was six days a week, and she was, at the same time, a single mother. Yet she found the time to produce concerts for new and emerging modern dance choreographers. At a time when the dance world wasn't really welcoming people of color, she encouraged, supported, nurtured, and created opportunities for such gifted choreographers as Donald McHale, Walter Nix, Lewis Johnson, Jaime Rogers, so many. In fact, I was a scholarship student at uh, June Taylor's when Louise took me to my very first concert. It was Donald McHale's company, and they were dancing the premiere performance of Rainbow Around My Shoulder. For me, it was a life-changing event. I, I just had no idea that dance could tell a story so powerfully and beautifully and heartbreaking at that it could bring an audience to tears. I, I, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm going to tell you that a couple of years later, she brought me together with Donald McHale, who was just starting a new piece called District Storyville. And um, she suggested that I might be good for the, a role in, one of, in that new ballet. And uh, he invited me to a rehearsal, and he asked me to join the company, and he asked me to do the, wom the woman role in Rainbow Around My Shoulder, which was... A dream come true. Uh, when she took over as the director of Clark Center, it became a home to so many dancers and choreographers and provided a place where people could take prices at affordable, uh, class at affordable prices. It was her policy that dance should be available to whoever wanted to study. It made no difference to her who you were, where you came from, what you looked like. If you loved dance, wanted to learn it, to create it, or just be a part of it, you found a home at Clark Center. To that end, I, not very many people know this, Louise chose to live on her Social Security, and she returned her salary checks back to Clark Center to subsidize the cost of keeping the classes down at a low rate. 
Of course, paying her own bills was another issue. So life was always a struggle, and when I dared to suggest to her that if she just once in a while took her paycheck, you know, life would be easier, and she got very huffy, as I'm sure those of you who know her, she could. She said, I'm a very rich woman, I just don't have any money. <laughs> she created a place where everyone felt they were part of the Clark Center community. For example, frequently on Christmas Day, because so many students were from out of town or just had nowhere to go for the holidays, Louise would invite everyone to Clark Center, where there would be free classes, refreshments, and live music. If she heard about a person who was struggling and didn't have enough to eat, she would feed them. If somebody was having trouble and couldn't find a place to sleep, she took them home with her. Louise had such admiration and appreciation for the talented teachers who taught at Clark Center that she instituted a, instituted a policy that guaranteed them a minimum amount uh, per class, regardless of how many students were in attendance. I mean, this was unheard of, and whoops, sorry, no other dance facility treated their instructors with such respect. As Clark Center director, Louise continued presenting the new choreographers' concerts annually, and she's provided artists with, as in the past, with so much free space in which to create and rehearse their work. I was going to try to name some of them, but I only have five minutes, and you've already seen it up there, so you already know the companies that pass through Clark Center. She offered scholarships to budding dancers whose gifts might not have been recognized in other dance facilities because of their size, shape, color, etc. And Louise has to be credited for the courage and foresight to welcome, support, provide, the black dance community with a safe and nurturing home when acceptance was hard to come by. The one non-dance not accomplishment of which she was very proud uh, when she was the director was the development of Playwrights Horizons. While she was still at June Taylor's, there was a little girl taking classes, and though she clearly wasn't going to be a dancer, Louise saw something very special in her, and she sort of kept in touch with her over the years. All those years later, at Louise's invitation, that girl, whose name was Wendy Wasserstein, <laughs> had her very first stage play read at Playwrights Horizons at Clark Center. Louise had a vision for Clark Center. It was to have its own building, which would house a theater specifically designed for dance. This was way before the Joyce. And she would also have ample space for teaching and rehearsals. 42nd Street was just at the beginning of transforming into Theater Row. And she, sat, she saw a building there that she felt would be perfect. She began the search for grants and funding and negotiating, negotiated a matching fund agreement with Gordon Davis, who at that time was head of the New York Parks Department. So she threw this huge celebratory party in the empty building. Plans and preparations were underway, and the lease for the old Ninth Avenue space was not renewed. Unfortunately, some months after that, there was a New York City election and the new administration reneged on that Gordon Davis agreement and decided not to honor the agreement and, the fund, and fund the project, so it just died. I don't think I ever saw Louise so devastated. Before long, she resigned. But the last event she produced was a five-week dance festival at the Douglas Fairbanks Theater at the CUNY Mall on 42nd Street, and she quipped, well, we did succeed in bringing dance to 42nd Street. <laughs> Louise was the recipient of the Bessie Award. She also won the Capizio Dance Foundation Award uh, for, quote, behind-the-scenes work enriched, that enriched the history of modern dance. I've never met anyone who was so selfless, passionate, and devoted to dance. Her contribution to the dance world was historic, in my opinion. And I'm so very pleased that she's being recognized and remembered today. The Clark Center in which I became interested and the organization that interviewed and then hired me was something that Alvin Ailey started. And then there was this huge auditorium down below, the one that had been, as you mentioned, the showbiz part. Right. And Alvin moved in. Um. And that was, and why is it called Clark Center? Because when they were wandering around, they found a sign that said, Clark Auditorium. So I was really quite excited um, to go there. And in the course of, I stayed there for 16 years. And in the course of my life there, I did briefly realize the beginnings of what had been my, my little dream of glory. Uh -huh. I, um, I always look upon what I do as young talent, uh -huh. new people, take a chance, nourish them, help them 
develop. Right. Yes. In part of my life at Clark Center, this did indeed happen. Ramona, you uh, were one of those young people that got started at the Clark Center, and you met Louise, and it sounds like she was, as some of some of the other folks have described, a little bit difficult. Um, but then you you also had, you, you were telling me you had a sort of change in your relationship over time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. I was young once, that's true. <laughs> um, but uh, when I first met Louise, I was so intimidated by her. I didn't realize that women who run a tight ship can also be intimidating. And she is one of the people who inspired me because I run a tight ship in the things that I do, and inspired me to be the person I am today. I came to Clark Center through Charles Moore. Um, I was taking classes in Brooklyn. Thank you. I was taking, <laughs> I was taking classes in Brooklyn, doing a lot of dance classes. Uh, when BAM offered classes for the community, a lot of those little dancing schools, Miss Nancy's dancing school, and little by little I progressed to BAM where Charles was teaching. And Charles actually brought me to Clark Center. Once I got there, was my God, you know, this is a real professional dance school. And I felt so wonderful being in the atmosphere of people who were inspiring to dance for, with, and around. So um, when I got to Clark Center, when I saw Louise sitting in, in the office, I paid my money or presented my card, waved to the dog, and got into the dressing room. <laughs> I did not linger. I did not linger at the office. Mm -hmm. But over time, something oh, changed. Oh, sorry. Yes, you did ask a two-part question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I used to be young. So, um, so for years, I was at Clark Center. I took Charles's class. Sometimes I, I substituted for him when he didn't show up at all or when he was late. And um, then Charles, you know, many years later, Charles passed away. And it was at that point when Charles Blackwell... Louise Roberts and I were the three people who actually led the committee to um, present or to organize his memorial service. And in working with Louise at the memorial, for the memorial service, I realized this woman is so powerful. She is so loving, she is so generous, and she runs a tight ship. It was at that point my attitude toward Louise became more of a um, loving admirer and almost a daughter. Um, I always admired her, but I was scared of her. <laughs> but I, I lost that fear when um, I began working with her. It was almost like we were working as two equals, woman and woman. It wasn't this little girl coming to class and seeing this old, gray-haired, white lady in the office who was just like... <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I really, really admired Louise all the time, but I lost that fear or intimidation when um, we worked together as equals. You mentioned Charles Moore, and you mentioned that you danced with this company. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to shift the conversation to some of these companies that really found themselves um, uh, strengthened or helped by the Clark Center. And we have a video, actually, that features you dancing. Um, <laughs> um, you're dancing Catherine Dunham's Shango with Charles Moore. And I'm just curious if you could maybe share with us before we watched what what was different about the experience of working on Dunham Shango than other dance experiences you had had? What did it mean to you? And what does what did working with Charles Moore on this piece mean to you? Well, I come from a Haitian background, and as a child, most of my memories of people talking about Haiti was very negative. It was voodoo, tonton makut, you know, uh, black magic. So when Charles said that we were going to do Shango, I was a little nervous. Actually, I was a lot nervous. And um, it was the first dance I think the company did that really had historic, uh, historic uh, uh, value. We had heard about Catherine Dunham throughout the years um, being in his company, because Charles talked about Catherine Dunham ceaselessly. We went to his house, we talked about Catherine Dunham. We were in class, he talked about Catherine Dunham. So we had heard a lot about Catherine Dunham and had not done anything, uh, anything close to a choreographed piece. We learned some of her movements but we hadn't done a piece. And for Charles to have chosen Shango of all the pieces to do, it made us a little nervous. Even Charles at the beginning of the video says, we were all scared. And I'll tell you the truth, we were. Um, what was different about Shango and doing the other dances that we did in the company, most of the performances that we had were very joyful. There was you know, a lot of uh, dances celebrating uh, life, celebrating um, uh, the, the, what do you call, the, uh, the harvest. 
everything was very up. We even had one dance called Bongo, even though it started out with someone getting killed. And we're doing a, a funeral dance around that. The dance turned into a very joyful dance because you do the nine nights and then you start partying. But this was the first dance we did that actually had such a, a dark, in my opinion, um, background. Even if you hear the music at the end, it's sort of very um, scary. Uh, I keep using that word because it was scary. And the other thing about learning Shango, I see Audrey in the audience, you probably remember this. When we were learning, <laughs> we were learning the dance at Clark Center in the studio that faced 8th Avenue. There were a couple of Dunham uh, people, dancers, who came in to teach it to us. And they were even more scary than learning the dance. <laughs> Because they looked at us like, who, who, who are you and what are you about to do? And I remember one person, I won't mention his name, who actually came into the studio with this giant piece of cake. And he sat on the floor, opened up the cake, and just ate it and told us what to do. So we were like, what? But we were very respectful. We were young. And we were very... <laughs> and so it was a whole, the whole thing was just an experience. But I loved being part of that. I'll tell you that working with Charles, um, he was the closest thing to me uh, to a father. I grew up without a father. But the other thing that Charles did for the entire company was he taught us who we were in this world, in the African diaspora. We had people from Puerto Rico, people from Trinidad, people from the South, people from Brooklyn. But he taught us all that we had this commonality as being part of the African diaspora and taught us what our culture was about, even though he always said, I've never been to Africa. You would never have known that from the way he treated us, the way he taught us the dances, and the way he taught us um, about who we were as people in this country. So. On certain theatrical presentations of American black people, that there was a whole culture being overlooked. When I danced with Catherine Dunham, she was the best. You couldn't go any higher. And when I danced her dance, Shango, I wasn't Charles Moore anymore. I was possessed. You had to beat in order to do the dance. We were all a little afraid.
Um, when we were prepping this program, Ramona made such a great point about um, the Clark Center and that really the Clark Center represented in many ways a continuation or the realization or the next steps in a tradition of dance excellence that was created by a pioneering generation of artists of color like Catherine Dunham and that the Clark Center continued and kind of expanded on a goal that she had, a, 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 and a, a commitment to inclusivity, a commitment to lifting up new voices. So I think it's really great that in this one clip you can see multiple generations, an art, uh, a choreographer like Catherine Dunham, a teacher and dancer like Kath, like uh, Charles Moore, and then you. Uh, in my youth. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of uh, people in there doing amazing things in their youth, I cannot wait to show you all this next clip because it features Marshall. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> Jill showed me this clip, which you all selected to share, and um, uh, I, I just love it. Anyway, it's you dancing a work by Elio Palmieri, and, and, and I just want to know, Marshall, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started dancing with Elio and tell us how you met him at the Clark Center? My, my first class was uh, at Clark Center. And my first work with him was called Epitaph. And it was kind of a very funny, uh, uh, I mean, dramatically, uh, the work was intense. Not only did I play baby Jesus with uh, the Statue of Liberty, and I had to cross the stage at one time touching myself, which my parents went a little bit berserk. <laughs> but, uh, that enticed Elio to invite me to his company uh, uh, to work with him. And uh, as a habit, I usually watch, always watch performance. Wherever I was on stage, I always watch. And uh, one day we were in Texas, Elio got hurt. And uh, of course, <clears throat> that was the first piece, first number, Prophet Jones. And of course, some of you, I don't know if you know, uh, Prophet was uh, 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 a gay man, a great gay preacher. Uh, of course, I said, I know it, I know it. <laughs> and you said, okay, uh, you know it. <laughs> and, you, and you let me on stage. Did, uh, it was the second number in, in the ballet, first, first number. And I didn't come off the stage. Elio called me every bad name, M words, F words, everything possible. And I mean, it's having nervous breakdown. I went in, I couldn't stop crying. I went to the, uh, uh, to the park and I sat on the swing and I'm still crying. Uh, there's a friend named Diane Harvey <laughs> and Robert Pixar. They came in and talked to me and calmed me down. Then they went back to talk to Elio. And uh, Elio said, have the boy come in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I for rehearsal. At 8 o'clock in the morning I was there. Elio worked me from 8 to 4.30. Five o'clock, non-stop. That evening, went on stage, performed. And you came back, and you looked at me. He said, the ballet is yours. I'll never do it again. Besides <laughs> that day, that became my first solo, solo in Elio's company.
one that is shown, but Jill is the one that said to show. And then he insisted that Evan and I cut it. No, I couldn't cut it. I couldn't cut it. Yeah. I love, I love it. It's one, one of my new favorite things. I love that moment when, when you run up to upstage and, and and you see the sequence on the, the first time I noticed it. And I asked you about it, and you, who made the costume? Elio did. <laughs> it's just, just one thing working, working with Elio. He made all the costumes, and he made you do the costume as well. So not only did he teach you lighting, he taught you lighting, he taught you to sew, he taught you to cook, he taught you, he teaches everything. <laughs> So it was a whole uh, way of sharing. And how old were you when you first learned the work and when you performed it here? I was uh, 17. <laughs> uh, and until today, thank God, I'm the one who keep, uh, keeping his memories legacy alive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've been especially uh, blessed. We were uh, performed at Summer Stage. And uh, Diane Harvey uh, did Hex by Elio Pomari. And in October, Alpha Omega is going to do another piece by Elio called Tabernacle that's just breathtaking. So Trying to keep the legacy going. So important. So important. Thank you, Marsha. So, Sandra, we, we've been talking about mentors and, and various generations passing on a tr tradition of excellence. You had... Um, I think that experience with Ballet Hispanico as well. Could you tell us a little bit about Tina Ramirez and what she was like as a mentor and a teacher for you? Um, you know, recently her niece, Coco Pelais, said to me, you know, Tina worked so hard when she had her school, which is where I started my training, the Tina Ramirez School of Spanish Dance. And for some reason that hit me 
to the core because I remember how hard she worked in those classes. She taught Saturdays from like 10 o'clock till six o'clock without a break. So I'm sure there's somebody, there are a few people here that um, experience that, that know exactly what, what um, I mean by that. So, and, and it's her starting Ballet Hispanico and looking at some of the video that I picked, um, someone that was so committed to, to this vision that she had, that came from the ground, it came from her love of her community and her um, fierce dedication. Yeah, we, you, you picked an interview clip where you can definitely hear, we're going to watch it now, but you can hear that commitment, that love for the community and love for nurturing younger talent. Um, let's watch Tina, Tina, Tina Ramirez. I use the term ballet as anything that is dancing, that has a storyline. Because I believe that there's two types of dancing, good and bad. The other thing is conditioning. Now, I've trained dancers, and they, some of the boy dancers, the male dancers are going into ballet companies. That's what they want to do. Naturally, you know, they're, they're 15 and 16, so they, they still can't point one out and say, he's one of my dancers that started with me. But they started with flamenco. And they started, and you teach, what is dancing except correct placement, the body placement. And um, what's most important, I think the artistic training that one gives them, or the feeling of drama or of the movement, and I hope that it shows in the dances that I have trained that they love to move, because that's very important to me. So your experience coming to Clark Center is a little different than one that we've heard because you came to Clark Center with the company, correct? Yes. So I would, I'm curious for you to maybe explain to us what did the Clark Center mean to a dance company? Like what did it mean to Ballet Hispanico? And then what did it mean to you personally once you were there? What were your experiences like there that were formative to you personally? So as you see the clip of Tita Ramirez, here's a very fierce and dedicated individual who's working so hard and every, every, every step becomes significant. And if you are presented by a prestigious organization such as Clark Center, it's a step forward. Um, and to be presented also meant at Clark Center meant to have space. And even though Tina had her school, she was developing the school at such a um, fast pace that that studio was always occupied. So we would always have to go find you know, space to rehearse. So having uh, the sponsorship of Clark Center provided some of that space, um, as well as getting uh, reviews in the New York Times. So it was, it was, it was significant, the resources that uh, Clark Center was able to provide, and a company such as Ballet Hispanico in its infancy was benefiting, benefiting from. Um, one particular individual, Tally Beatty, <laughs> who became, uh, we, Ballet Hispanico, I think we did about four of his ballets, but the very first piece that um, he choreographed was created in Clark Center. And then it was as and after it was choreographed, we presented it there, and um, so working with Tali Beatty and doing his work, it, we progress in 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 um, the pieces that he did. Eventually, he did one big piece called Tres Cantos, three pieces. Um, there's some people here that dance in that piece, um, and. His work was so difficult, of those of you who might have worked with him, really rigorous, um, intense. So to have the opportunity to have his work, to be able to do it, starting with this small dance that we did that was called Look at, the, look, look at All Those Lovely Red Roses, um, a Santana piece. And the next clip that you'll see, <laughs> He did a piece called Tres Cantos, three pieces that is based on a historic um, 
the history of Mexico. It starts with the fierceness of the Aztecs, the conquests um, and destruction from the Spaniards and how that a new people is created. Um, so to have the opportunity to have that peace that you're gonna see was, you're gonna see is at the Delacorte. And again, there's this sort of like um, interesting connection to that because Thelma Hill, who was one of the great dance educators and dance artists connected to Clark Center, somehow was in the committee for the Delacorte and recommended Ballet Hispanico. And of course, that was a really big, epic moment in the life of Ballet Hispanico to be in this prestigious um, dance festival in New York City. And we, I think we, we ended up participating twice, but to, to, be, to do that, again, I'm thinking of Tina and the many dancers that worked so hard in those early years to be able to um, partake of something so incredible as being in the Delacorte was something that was affirming, inspiring, and those moments help us to move forward, you know, to move forward. As a dancer, Louise Roberts, who was so generous of spirit, was always telling, you know, Val Hispanico dances, whenever you want to come, come and take the class. And I took her offer and came for about two summers and I studied in particular the Limon technique with Leonora Latimer. And while that was not something that was easy on my body, it was just wonderful to experience a different way of, of moving. And something that was really um, very life of, uh, um, changed me was when I found out that Limon was, it was Jose Limon. <laughs> and as a young Puerto Rican woman from East Harlem, it was like, he's Mexican. And that to me was a big deal. It was important to see un Latino doing work that was not folkloric, but it was taking contemporary dance and creating something of, of um, significance. So I went to the library, looked him up, and I saw his piece, La Malinche, which is, again, it has to do with the uh, uh, Mexican history. And to see how this dance brought about this history, so rich, this character, was, again, something very inspiring. So working with Tali Beatty on this other Mexican piece, I feel like that was something that I contributed through to his choreography to see how you could create movement that was um, true to something, true to some ethnicity, true to where I came from, even though I'm not Mexican. But understanding that on some level was something that shifted um, the way that I looked at dance and you know, fed the artistry that is so important to, um, to the dance world. Let's watch this excerpt of Trace Cantos at the Delacorte, uh, featuring you. Um, and uh, thanks for the library plug. <laughs> I have two more stories about that, but I'll wait to say yeah, for like... next year. <laughs> I, I'll say just look at you know you're going to hear some music by Sylvester Revueltas and Carlos Chavez. Carlos Chavez's papers are here. You're going to see some costume designs by Patricia Zipperd, and her papers are here. So and this video, of course, is here. So. Let's watch Tris Contos. Thank you. 
Sheila. Yes. You, <laughs> uh, your, your story, I think, of your involvement with Clark Center is similar to Sandra's because you came to work at Clark Center, Center with um, Dance Theater of Harlem, right? And Well, I wasn't in that performance that when they performed. Oh, okay. No, I wasn't... Uh, the, I first came to Clark Center before oh, you did. I okay. even joined um, Dance Theater of Harlem. My sister Nanette Bearden, she brought me in, and all I had done up to then was ballet. So she knew I needed more to... <laughs> uh, she knew the value of knowing other techniques and also of me learning about my roots and... Um, the African influence, influences. Um, so she brought me up there, introduced me to um, Louise. Her and Louise uh, knew each other, but she was very friendly with Thelma Hill. And she wanted me to take the Horton technique with Thelma. So that was my first um, um, experience going there. After a while, I did branch out and I took Pepsi Bethel, uh, <laughs> Jazz, and uh, Pearl Reynolds, and Lamone, and also mm -hmm. I branched out. Like you said, it was so tempting when you looked in at the other classes at all what was going on. You know, your body wanted to be in there, wanted to be in that class. So your dance education at the Clark Center actually enabled your career in part at Dance, dance Theater of Harlem. I would say so. Though Mr. Mitchell didn't want us to. <laughs> he wanted his ballerinas to just do ballet. And he didn't really want us to go out and study other techniques. So some of us would sneak out and, 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 and do, yeah. Okay. So can you tell us then, so it sounds like um, Clark Center was very impactful on your dance education and the way you, you, you've thought of yourself as an individual artist, but it also had an impact on the history of the company, uh, Dance Theater of Harlem. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What did Clark Center mean to the company? Well, um, it was all those things that Shelley mentioned when she spoke as far as nurturing dancers, and um, that performance that Dance Theatre of Harlem had there, we were just a, you know, um, a budding company with no real experience. So to be able to be part of the choreographers' workshops and those other performing experiences was, uh, was what we needed and what Mr. Mitchell knew that we needed. You chose um, as a excerpt of performance footage "Forces of Rhythm," a Lewis Johnson work. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you choose it? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, um, we all love Lewis. <laughs> That's universal. <laughs> we all love Lewis Johnson, and um, this ballet it had to do with. He used ballet technique, African technique, and what would I say, yeah. spiritual or uh, contemporary movement. Because mm -hmm. we had skirt girls, and we had ballet girls, and then we had the, the voice, the African dance. So it was new and exciting for us. It was different. So little bit of a like a reflection of what it would probably be like to, to experience uh, a, a couple of classes in a row at the Clark Center. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let, let's watch this um, so that we can uh, enjoy it and then maybe open it up to, the, to everyone else to share a few memories. Thank you. 
center really gave an opportunity for small and emerging companies to perform. It was lacking then, and in a lot of ways, it's still a problem now. So that, that was a very important aspect of our, our story. Well, it's amazing how many companies um, went on to do very incredible, and choreographers did incredible, successful things because someone gave them a chance at the Spark right. Center. It's an amazing um, track record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, maybe we can bring the house lights up a little bit. We've got another really special video to share, but I thought we could devote, you know, another 10 minutes or so just to any questions you have, or maybe you all can share a memory of an opportunity or an experience that you had uh, uh, benefiting from the Clark Center. You know, these are just stories from the people who started working on this project, but there are probably 500 more stories to be told. Uh, the archives are vast, and thank goodness Louise had the foresight to gather the papers, give them to the library, and really lay out a, a, a roadmap for us. And um, it's, it's just been an incredible journey going through our history. And I, I know you share a lot of that with us. I, um, Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah.
Sundays when you could come to Park Center and take a half hour, 30 minutes with all the teachers, and it's sort of like you tried it out before you bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I went there at one and didn't leave till six thirty. <laughs> I mean, there was just so much, like you said, the community. You could hear music coming from each room. There were rhythms. There were drummers. There was there was the traffic on the street. But there was something so intrusive. Everyone was included in. And I just I don't know who thought that up. I guess the ladies, but I thought that was pretty amazing. For a day, you could take class for free. So that was my idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the year that I came to class, I was just coming out of college, and I had been exposed to um, a lot of dance in college, but it wasn't the influences that I received when I got to class. And class since then, and meeting Thelma Hill and Kathy Stanley Grant changed my life because they were the examples of excellence in pedagogy. That I then used when I taught for 26 years in the Department of Education. <laughs> so the teachers were excellent educators to teach yeah. those of us who also not only performed, but also became teachers and the dancers now that we have in public school. And we, my center is all over. Mm -hmm. and I can see how that really fed so many generations of dancers because of the industry. But I just love being in your point that there was this exponential impact from Clark Center and so even though there's still not a place that you can go Clark Center that it exists in your classroom in your classroom in your classroom and it's actually still still here any any other last uh, comment or observation yes sir So, 
So with that in mind, yeah, please, in mind. I just want to say, and Audrey, that's so true, uh, an experience I had many years ago before we even started remembering Clark Center, I was telling um, the folks up here this at our meeting, I was walking down the street on 57th and Broadway, and there used to be a little pastry shop there. I worked at Cosmo, which is across the street. I was, you know, lunch hour, I got this to do, I got that to do, I got this to do, got that to do, and then I have to have lunch. So you're not, in the, you're not in the mood to stop and talk to people, you just want to get to Dwayne Reed, you want to get your lunch, you want to get back in time. And I was walking past this pastry shop right in the corner, 57th and Broadway, and this homeless person was begging for money to get food. And he's begging, and in my typical New York style, I didn't see him. Until he said, wait a minute, you went to Clark Center, didn't you? <laughs> I was totally stunned. So of course, I stopped my tracks. I started speaking to him. He told me who he was. He remembered me from classes. He remembered I danced with Charles Moore. Of course, I took money out of my pocket, more than I would have given anybody who was begging on the street. And then I told him, there's a homeless, uh, there was a program at St. Paul's Church on 9th, 9th Avenue. But it, was, it really struck me that the, the beauty of Clark Center is that, as Audrey said, we pass each other on the street, we don't know faces, we don't know names. And sometimes we don't even know the person actually went to Clark Center, a homeless person on the street who remembered his experiences at a beautiful place like Clark Center. It's, I still get chills when I think about that. So. <laughs> Well, with that in mind, so the library is going to kick us out at 8 o'clock. And um, we've got another really special video to show. So I'd love to bring the house lights back down. I want to say, with, with, with your point in mind and, and all, all that you've said, this library is a great home for the Clark Center, Clark Center family. We're really honored to be one of the homes Thank of the welcome. Clark Center. Yeah. Um, uh, Tell us first, because we're, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary this year, so where, how are the other ways we can celebrate upcoming? Oh. <laughs> I got your website. I see. Evan put our website up. If you go to the uh, page um, uh, membership and donations, you can add your name to our mailing list. We have a big party coming up, our 60th anniversary house party, on October 6th. It's the afternoon. We're hoping that you'll all come and bring your kids, bring your parents, everybody. And um, we have the best DJ, and we always have the best time. Um, we're going to also do in um, October 15th and 16th, it's going to be our second annual showcase, where we try to um, share dancers who are part of our legacy, and include emerging choreographers on one bill to uh, really promote our remembering our history and dancing into the future. Uh, it's so important that we preserve the work of people like Elio Pomari, uh, Jeffrey Holder, Tally Beatty, Louis Johnson. Louis Johnson, and also give talented young choreographers an opportunity to have their worth, work seen. So I, I just urge you to sign up for our mailing list. There was a paper outside. If you signed up there, we'll add you automatically. And um, just stay connected with us. Oh, thank you. We also have a page on Facebook that I mentioned earlier. <laughs> it's called Remembering Clark Center. And so all you have to do is request membership and Anybody can see the page. Yeah. Anybody can see the page, but only members can post. So Jill, we've got one more video. It's pretty special. Um, I would like for you to explain to us what actually happened 60 years ago. What happened in 1959? What are we celebrating this year before we watch an excerpt of Revelation? Um. Uh, Alvin Ailey was working with Lena Horne on Broadway in a show called Jamaica and she would uh, generously allow him to use the stage on matinee days to experiment uh, there were very few spaces in the theater district that would allow a dancer of color 
to even rent a studio. Charles Blackwell, who you heard mentioned earlier, went to this building on 51st Street, and it was a YWCA, and he said, this is a place where you do good work, right? And the woman, Adele Holt, said, yes. And he said, well, why don't you do good work and let this man use space to rehearse? And that was how uh, Mr. Ailey arrived at was then just a, an emerging settlement house. Uh, he and Arnie Parnham did a concert in 59 at the 92nd Street Y. Adele Holtz came. She saw the concert and totally revamped her program and invited Mr. Ailey to come in and start a dance program at Clark Center. And it was there that Revelations was created. So we have amazing footage um, from uh, 1962, I think, is when the broadcast was. This and is from Lamp Unto My Feet? That's correct, yeah. yeah. You can watch the whole thing here at the library. Who, who, who are some of the dancers we can see dancing? Ah, Mr. Ailey will take your breath away. Selma Hill. Uh, Minnie Marshall, Minnie Marshall uh, right, um, <laughs> you all know, <laughs> um, Ella, Selma Hill, Ella, James Truitt, yeah, you'll recognize them when you yeah. see them. <laughs> It's really special footage, but before we watch it, this is, this is us saying goodbye, and I also want to say thank you all so much for being here. And please thank Ramona and Jill and Marshall and Sandra and Sheila and Shelly and Shelly. And I want to especially uh, thank all the incredible colleagues of mine that work at the Jerome Robbins Dance Division here, because they take care of all of this history and make sure that it's available for new generations to see. So you guys can go down and sit down in, in the audience and we'll turn the lights off after you're there and we'll watch this video. How about that? I'm not going to 